Uh, my name is Paul Miser, and I'll be your moderator for today's webcast presentation, hosted by IIR, the Institute for International Research. IIR is the world's largest producer of educational conferences, including market research. Our thought leader for today is Tony Ulwick, CEO and founder of Stratagen. Tony is a thought leader, author, and a longtime pr practitioner in the field of innovation. Tony is the inventor of outcome-driven innovation, a patented process built around the theory that people buy products to get jobs done. His methodology has been adopted as a best practice by dozens of the world's leading firms, including Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, Kimberly Clark, and Colgate Palmolive. Today's presentation is entitled, Why Your Idea is Worth Nothing and How to Create Growth Plans at Work. With that, Tony, why don't you take it from here? Well, thank you very much, and I, I thank you all for joining us today. Again, sorry for that delay. Well, it's clear to um, it's clear that we all share a common interest. We're all in search of the best ways to generate ideas that will accelerate company growth. And uh, my hope for today is that the thinking that we share with you will contribute to your success. So let's just uh, go ahead and get started. Well, uh, we've all heard that innovation begins with an idea, uh, an epiphany, like a flash of insight in how to create value. And recognizing that innovation begins with an idea, uh, the first step in nearly all the gated uh, product development processes is what is called the idea screen. And dozens of academics have helped shape this theory, while uh, an endless number of innovation practitioners have created tools to assist in generating uh, good ideas. Uh, one such tool, of course, is uh, that's been around for quite a long time now is brainstorming. And this makes a lot of sense because innovation begins with an idea, and having lots of ideas to help fuel the innovation process uh, will certainly enhance it. So this is what brainstorming is all about. Lots of ideas, uh, and in fact, uh, the success of a brainstorming session is often measured by the number of ideas that it produces. To ensure uh, a lot of ideas result from a brainstorming session, the universal rule has been adopted. And I know we all know this rule. Uh, when in the brainstorming session, there's no such thing as bad idea. And with this rule in effect, people, of course, are encouraged to state their ideas without fear of ridicule, uh, ridicule or judgment. Uh, but does this really go far enough? Uh, in recent years, companies have reached a conclusion that they should not solely depend on new ideas from their local employees. Instead, they should seek out ideas from employees in other divisions, other geographies. And in some cases, they should tap people from outside the company. Now, this, of course, increases the chance of getting more and different ideas. And this approach is often referred to as open innovation. And there's been a number of variations on this thinking uh, over the years, but the goal is not to confine a company to its own biases and blinders when generating ideas for growth. So some very large companies have um, had the option to conduct open innovation activities across all company divisions and geographies. And one such company is IBM. Uh, they took this approach uh, in an attempt to bolster its innovation efforts. They hosted what was called the idea of Jam back in 2006. Um, here they invited 150,000 employees to participate worldwide, and this resulted in 46,000 ideas. So of course this provided them with a tremendous number of new inputs into the innovation process. Uh, it's pretty clear, I think, that ideas drive innovation, and the idea of Jam was the ultimate in generating uh, just a ton of ideas. And with that many ideas in the pipeline, IBM felt it was dramatically increasing its chances for accelerating its own growth. So uh, the need to fuel the innovation process for the ideas, I think, has shaped the way companies think about the innovation process. And what I want to do is to, uh, the first polling question for today is to poll the audience and um, ask this, uh, this question. Uh, do you agree or disagree that this thinking drives the type of innovation practices that your company uses today? And you can just click on the agree or disagree there, and uh, we'll keep the polling open for just a few seconds. And uh, so if you can respond quickly, that would be that would be excellent. And we're going to close the poll in three seconds. One and two. Okay. So it looks like there's uh, certainly agreement and disagreement on this issue, which is, is really quite interesting. I think that will make for a great conversation today. Um, you know, obviously, a number of you think that it's had a great impact on the way um, you execute the inno innovation process, and uh, unfortunately, I think that's a problem because there is a problem with this thinking, and um, you know, it makes the innovation process, as I'll show you, very ineffective. Because the truth is, uh, there really is an endless supply of bad ideas in the world. And uh, anyone of you who have sat in brainstorming sessions know that this is true. 
Uh, I mean, do we think that the idea gene produced 46,000 great ideas? Uh, well, we know it didn't. In fact, nearly none of them were, were worth anything, and many of those that were chased uh, were not uh, good either. Uh, chasing bad ideas, by the way, is, uh, even though they're well championed, is the most wasteful expenditure in business today. Uh, Fortune 1000 companies collectively waste over $100 billion each year chasing bad ideas. So, of course, this is a huge waste of company time, resources, and capital. Uh, the reality is it's really hard to have a great idea. Uh, by that, I mean an idea for a new product or service that's going to contribute significantly to accelerating companies' growth. Now, um, I learned this lesson back in my days at IBM. Uh, I was working as an engineer on a project that you might that was the PC Junior. And internally, we thought this product was a great idea. It was uh, IBM's entree into the home computing market. It was very exciting. Expectations were high. Unfortunately, the day after it was launched, the headlines in the Wall Street Journal read, PC Junior is a flop. And unfortunately, they were right. It was a flop. Uh, IBM invested $800 million into this market and it turned out to be a waste of time and resources and capital. And on a personal level, it was devastating for a lot of people. So as you know, um, bad ideas and new product failures weren't uh, uncommon back in the 1980s, but surprisingly, they're no less uh, common today. Um, last year, we analyzed 12 different studies on new product success rates, and on average, they showed that even today, new product success rates, which include product improvement releases or sustaining innovation releases, uh, succeed just 17% of the time. Now, keep in mind, these failed new products are more than just ideas. These are ideas that were validated, refined, and tested for months prior to launch uh, to ensure the success, yet they still failed 83% of the time. When it comes to ideas for accelerating, accelerating growth in new markets, the success rate is even worse. It's less than 2%. So that's a 98% failure rate. And again, these aren't just raw ideas. These are ideas that were tested and refined before they were launched into the marketplace. So now let's turn to your ideas. Again, I'm not talking about ideas for new features on a current product. I'm talking about ideas for new products. And you probably had um, thought of some new product ideas during your career. You may have many ideas in your head right now. But uh, here's the reality. The chances that your unrefined, untested raw idea for a new product will fail in the marketplace is nearly 100%. And spending time and effort on it to test it and refine it may increase the chances of success, but to only between 2% and 17%. But as it stands today, chances are your idea is worth nothing. In fact, pursuing it is probably a liability, not an investment in your company's future. Now, I know this sounds harsh, but it is true. Uh, your idea is worth nothing. Worse yet, pursuing it will likely drain company resources. But does it have to be this way? No, it doesn't. But uh, before we describe why it doesn't and how it doesn't have to be this way, let's first understand why your idea is worth nothing. There's three main reasons. They relate to markets, needs, and strategy. And understanding why your approach is worth nothing is the key to creating a better approach. So the first reason that your idea is worth nothing is chances are your idea isn't in a financially attractive market. Now, unfortunately, not every market offers a chance to achieve its revenue objectives. So uh, this concept is quite simple. You can't have a billion-dollar idea in a $50 million market. Yet companies make the mistake all the time. Uh, a C-level executive in a major medical device company uh, confided in me with the fact that they invested $10 million in a market that turned out just to be a $20 million market. Uh, worse yet, this happened while they were looking for growth in half-billion-dollar chunks. Uh, they concluded that half the products in development were in markets they shouldn't even be in, and that this was really hurting the company along a lot of different fronts. So not unlike them, chances are your idea is in an unattractive market as well and uh, destined to failure. The second reason your idea is worth nothing is that chances are uh, your idea doesn't address the right customer needs. It may not enable the execution of the entire job the customer is trying to get done. Uh, it may not be better than competing solutions. It may address needs that are already satisfied or even overserved. But most likely, chances are it doesn't address a significant number of unmet needs or do so effectively. And the end result is obvious. Uh, ideas that fail to address the right customer needs are destined for failure in the marketplace. And chances are that your idea is one of those. 
The third reason your idea is worth nothing is that chances are your idea isn't based on a solid strategy. It may follow a strategy for, sustain, for sustaining innovation when a strategy for disruption is needed, or it may follow a strategy for breakthrough or radical innovation when a strategy for product improvement is needed. Uh, it may call for unnecessary investment in a new platform or additional investment in an obsolete platform. There's certainly many complexities that stand in the way of sound strategy. And given these complexities, chances are that your idea is not strategically sound and, again, is destined to failure. So you may hope that it's not true, but chances are your idea is worth nothing for one or more of these three reasons. And chasing an idea because you have passion for it sounds enticing, I know, but uh, there has to be a better way. I mean, it would be just as easy to, or even easier, to have passion for an idea that's likely to succeed as it is to have passion for one that's likely to fail. So why do we keep having ideas that will fail? Well, the reason lies in the way companies think about the innovation process. Since they think innovation starts with an idea, they encourage people to have lots of ideas. And then, um, after they have the idea, they hope that the market, uh, that the idea is in an attractive market. And they hope that the idea will address the right customer needs. And they hope that the idea will follow the right strategy. But hope really isn't a great plan. And hope's not going to guarantee success. It's really a recipe for failure. So the reality is no matter how many ideas you have, you'll probably never have an idea, uh, idea that accelerates company growth. And by that we mean never. So how can we fix this? How can we have ideas that will accelerate company growth? Well, we fix this by not, not having ideas. Well, at least not as the first step in the innovation process. Uh, innovation shouldn't begin with an idea. Uh, what it should do, it should begin with a careful selection of an attractive market for pursuit. We don't want to pursue a $50 million market if we're trying to generate $100 million or a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, once it's certain that the market uh, is worthy of pursuit, then it must be determined precisely what that unmet needs exist. And with knowledge of the unmet needs, then it must be determined if a new platform is needed or not. And then and only then is it time to have ideas, because only then is it likely to have great ideas on how to address specific unmet needs on the right platform and in an attractive market. And having all this knowledge before generating ideas will guarantee your success. So let me show you how. So we're talking about creating ideas for growth. It's all about selecting the right markets, uh, the right needs to focus on, and the right strategies to pursue. So I'm going to be talking about uh, all three of these in some level of detail. So let's start with markets. Uh, what exactly is an attractive market? Now, uh, this is a very uh, critical and fundamental question because selecting an attractive market to pursue is really the key to accelerating company growth. And so what do I mean by attractive? Uh, well, I know there's other considerations that need to be made, but the most important one we want to talk about today uh, is financially attractive. Uh, pursuing it must help your company achieve its growth objectives. So how is this, determined, uh, how is this determination made uh, today? Well, the traditional method used to evaluate market attractiveness is based on uh, this definition of market potential, which is price times products times buyers. And uh, almost every market sizing analysis uses some variation of this definition. It comes from Philip Collar, very popular, and uh, it's been around for a long time. Well, uh, let's look now at how a company may uh, make a decision to pursue a market based on this thinking and this approach. And to do that, let's use the example of Microsoft's decision to enter the iPod market. So uh, the year was 2005, uh, iPod sales were flourishing, and Microsoft was evaluating the potential of the iPod market. And so using the traditional method of multiplying products times price times buyers, this market, of course, looked uh, very attractive. Uh, the iPod market saw dramatic growth. The prospect of getting 25% market share in a multi-billion dollar market was very appealing to Microsoft. So they decided to enter that market. It seemed like a safe bet. So in 2006, Microsoft introduced their product, which is called the Zoom. And it was very much like the iPod. It appeared to be a very solid competitor. And so it was clearly you know, focused on capturing the uh, some share of the iPod market. But the unexpected happened. Uh, in 2006, the growth of the iPod uh, market began to decline, quite dramatically, in fact. 
Uh, today it actually has negative growth. Uh, using price times products times buyers, the iPod market was all of a sudden a much less attractive market to be in. So how did Microsoft fare on all this? Well, the product never did well, uh, and market uh, the market exit seems uh, imminent. Uh, the Zoom turned out to be a bad idea, in essence, just like the PC Junior did. Uh, this to have an idea that's financially attractive, uh, even if you know, Microsoft using the most and, and the, the, the best ideas and tools available. So it can be very deceiving. All right, so let's put this uh, question to the audience. Um, what do you think the chances are that any given idea uh, will be in a market that is financially attractive to a company? Because we're all talking about having ideas um, without going through any analysis up front and just brainstorming solutions. What do you think the chances are that any given idea will be in a market that is financially attractive to the company? So again, I just want you to take uh, a little bit of time here to uh, choose your uh, answer. And uh, we're going to close this down in about three more seconds. Okay, so let's close that down. And we see that about um, half of the audience says it's uh, less than 5%. And you see only 5 or 6% of people saying it's over 50%. But the, the bulk is saying it's less than 10%. And you know, obviously, chances for success aren't the best, but it doesn't have to be that way. We know it's hard to determine if a market is financially attractive, and the reason for this is because of the way markets are traditionally defined. So here's traditional markets. For example, here's um, the market for LPs, the cassette market, the CD market, the iPod market. So what's the problem with these market definitions and the thought of Microsoft entering the iPod market? Well, defining a market with products is like driving by looking in the rearview mirror. That's the analogy we like to use. Uh, every product is soon going to be a thing of the past. LPs, cassettes, CDs. And why? Because people, uh, customers don't want iPods any more than they want CDs or 8-track tapes. What they want to do is to get a job done, in this case, listen to music. And... Um, this is much a better way to think about markets. The job doesn't change over time, regardless of the solutions. So a market can be defined as a group of job executors who want to get that job done. And this opens the door to new insights into evaluating the financial attractiveness of a market. So using this approach, in contrast, a company can calculate how many people want to get a job done and how much they're willing to pay to get the job done better. Now, these inputs allow a company to size market potential from uh, a very different perspective. This approach calculates the amount of new revenue potential, if any, that exists in the market and assesses whether or not the current solution over or underserves the market. So this is true in markets even where there's no product. So the approach can be used very effectively uh, even where markets don't exist from a current uh, perspective. So with this knowledge, a company can decide whether or not to enter a market and if it should be entered with a similar or a different product. So whereas Microsoft sized the market from a product perspective, uh, others didn't do that, and uh, Pandora was one of them. Uh, they could see that growth wasn't in the iPod market, rather it was in the market for helping people listen to music. So they didn't enter the iPod market. Instead, they entered uh, the market for listening to music with a new platform and a better solution. Now, ironically, they did this in the same year that Microsoft introduced the Zoom. So this could have been Microsoft's strategy, uh, but of course, it wasn't. Now, uh, as of February, uh, Pandora had uh, 80 million users, and they're adding about 90,000 users per day. Zoom, on the other hand, is facing imminent withdrawal from the market. Uh, and uh, so as you can see, knowing how to define a size market has dramatic implications on the success of an idea. So next, let's understand why your idea is probably not addressing the right uh, customer needs. So first, let's ask, what is a customer need? And uh, if we don't know what it needs are, then how can we have ideas that address them? Well, uh, we can't, of course, and then herein lies the problem. Uh, it turns out that 95% of companies don't have an agreed-on definition of what a customer need is. And it's very rare that a company knows all of its customers' needs. So this is a very fundamental problem. 
Companies listen to the voice of the customer, of course, but there's a fundamental flaw, uh, flaw in the VOC philosophy. Uh, VOC, as you probably know, uh, was designed to obtain customer inputs that relate to using a product. In other words, VLC is inherently tied to the past. So while VLC practices may be acceptable for sustaining innovation, uh, they do not provide the inputs needed to accelerate company growth. In other words, obtaining customer inputs to create a better iPod will not lead to the creation of Pandora. But obtaining customer inputs on the job of listening to music will. This is why we say that it's time to silence the voice of the customer as a practice. Uh, since people buy products to get jobs done, it makes sense to understand the job in its entirety, determine where people struggle to get that job done, and then figure out ways to help them get that job done better. So this is the goal of innovation and the way to achieve company growth. Now, when talking to customers about the job they're trying to get done, the goal should be to uncover the metrics they use to measure the successful execution of that job. Now, there's often between 50 and 150 different metrics. And obtaining these metrics is critical because these metrics are the customer's needs. And to be successful, your ideas must address these metrics. Now, this makes sense because customers want to execute every job quickly, predictably, and successfully. And this is why it's important to understand how they measure speed, stability, and output for each step in the job that they want to get done. To show you how uh, one company uses information to generate some powerful ideas, let's look at one of our case studies. Um, this is the two-way radio market, very mature market. It started with smoke signals, progressed to megaphones, walkie-talkies, and then to radios. And uh, we looked at this market with Motorola back in 1999 when it had 0% growth. And to generate more, uh, more growth, they didn't ask customers about improving existing products. And why? because customers don't want radios any more than they want smoke signals or megaphones. What they want is to be able to communicate in a dangerous situation. So this is the job that they were trying to get done. And this is an example of a customer need in this market. People want to minimize the time it takes to confirm receipt of the communication. Now, this is a legitimate customer need. It meets the 20 or so criteria that ensure it's unambiguous, quantifiable, and actionable. And you can learn a lot more about um, these criteria if you look at an article called uh, in the MIT Sloan uh, magazine called Giving Customers a Fair Hearing. It goes into a lot of detail about that. Uh, here's several more uh, examples of need statements. These all make sense whether you are thinking about smoke signals, megaphones, or radios. And this is because they're focused on the job of communicating in a dangerous situation. They're not focused on a product. And because they're independent of solutions and stable over time, they can be treated as a company asset for years to come. They drive the discovery of breakthrough ideas. Uh, they will drive the discovery of breakthrough ideas, uh, ideas for as long as a company wants to pursue that market. So remember, it's the technology that's changing here over time, not the job or the metrics used to measure its successful execution. So knowing the customer's needs is critical, but knowing which are unmet is really uh, essential to generating valuable ideas. And this can be accomplished by asking customers the importance of addressing each metric when executing the job in the degree to which each is satisfied with the current solutions. Now, this information can then be plotted onto what we call an opportunity landscape. And with this information plotted out, a company can see which of the 50 to 150 needs are important and unsatisfied or unmet uh, in any market at any time. And knowing all the customer's needs and which are unmet is the key to generating winning ideas. Now, to show you how this works, uh, let's look at this need, uh, minimize the time it takes to confirm receipt. Uh, it was rated important by 73% of the job executors, yet just 32% say they're satisfied with the currently available solutions. So this means the need is unmet, which in turn means an idea that addresses this unmet need would be valued by the job executors. So knowing where to focus their creativity, Motorola was able to come up with ideas that address many unmet needs in this particular market. And this led to a couple of uh, successful new products, one of which was the talk about, which you've probably seen. And this was a good idea because it addressed the needs that helped customers get a job done better, and it did so in an attractive market. So um, winning ideas you know, will precisely address a significant number of unmet needs. So what I want to do again is pull the audience and ask this question. Uh, using traditional methods, 
what do you think the chances are that uh, any given idea will better satisfy a significant number of the right 50 to 150 needs in a market? And again, we're just talking about using traditional methods. You have an idea. What do you think the chances are that that idea is going to significantly impact a good number of unmet customer needs? And we'll just pull for a few more seconds here. Thanks for the quick responses. And we're closing. So let's just take a quick look at that. So uh, again, we see a good portion of the audience uh, saying that the chances of, of the idea of addressing the chunk of them needs is less than 50%. Uh, about 75% of you say it's uh, less than 10% and so on. A small number uh, say it's over 50%. So it looks like you agree that the chances aren't uh, very good. So this takes us to the last reason uh, why most ideas are worth nothing, and uh, that is uh, strategy. Now, um, I know strategy can be defined in many different ways, and today we want to discuss one aspect of strategy uh, that impacts uh, idea generation, and uh, that is the product strategy. So let me get into that. So what do we mean by product strategy? Well, we mean by uh, we mean choosing the right platform strategy. Um, should it be disruptive? Should it be breakthrough? Or does a sustaining or product improvement strategy work best? Now, these decisions are critical um, and must be made very carefully. Generating ideas for product improvement when a strategy for low-cost disruption, for example, uh, will certainly lead to a bad idea and a waste of companies' time and resources and capital. So how is this decision currently made? Well, the interest say companies are protective of their existing products and platforms, which makes sense because, after all, they've invested a lot, of, a lot of money and time into them, and they don't want to cannibalize the revenue that those products generate. Um, by the same uh, token, companies also know that they can't just invest in sustaining innovation. So what is the answer? Well, they often create a portfolio strategy that allocates a percentage of their investment in each area, uh, something like we show here, where there may be 50% in the sustaining area, 10% in breakthrough, and 20% in product improvement and in disruption. Um, <clears throat> so this brings up the question then, what is the right allocation? And should we make an investment in each area? And I've seen a lot of debate on this. Uh, it's often the subject of uh, great debate. Uh, some may argue that uh, mostly breakthrough strategies should be pursued. Others would argue differently. So uh, how do you know that your idea is following the best strategy for the market? Again, we want to come back and pull the um, audience on this. So obviously, this is not straightforward, but let's get your views on this. Using traditional methods, what do you think the chances are that any given idea will have correctly chosen the right product strategy? Again, this is um, you having an idea, and then the chances of that idea um, actually addressing the correct product strategy. Okay, so we're uh, polling. Again, thank you for the very quick responses. All right, we're going to close the poll. And here we have um, about 25% saying it's less than 10%, and the bulk in the less than 25% uh, range. Again, it's a very tough decision. Um, and you can see how these are just layering on top of each other. You know, difficulty in picking the right market, picking the right needs, and picking the right strategy. But here's a real interesting thing about um, this particular decision. You actually don't have to decide. And so uh, let's talk about why. Uh, the reason is the market actually decides this for you. This isn't a decision that you should be made, um, that you should make. Uh, the truth is you really don't get a vote. Only one of these strategies is going to work in the market that you're selecting, and you have to know which one it is or else your idea is going to fail. Now, the right strategy is dependent on the current solutions and unmet needs in the market. So I know this might be a little confusing, so let me jump into each of these and explain. And to do that, let's return back to that opportunity landscape that I showed you before. And we're going to use this landscape to demonstrate how the opportunities in the market uh, dictate the product strategy that should be pursued. So uh, let's say that this is the opportunity landscape for your market. 
and all landscapes look different. They could be positioned anywhere on this um, on this grid. And this landscape shows the importance and satisfaction of the 50 to 150 different uh, needs. That's what each of those dots represent. Now, um, the visual display of unmet needs is telling you that one of two uh, uh, possibilities exist here. So you can see those needs that are underserved in this particular case. <coughs> Um, in both cases, we can clearly see here that um, the market is underserved, meaning that there are a number of unmet needs, and uh, there's opportunities to help the customer get the job done better. Now, if these needs can be addressed by adding features to the existing product platform, then, a, then that would obviously would be the strategy to follow, and you'd follow, in that case, a product improvement strategy. That would be the, the, the one that would make most sense for pursuit. This would create the value that's desired by the customer and at minimal cost to the company as they're not investing in a new platform. So this is very straightforward. Now, the goal of a product improvement strategy is to add a number of features to the current platform that address the unmet needs and enable the customer to get the job done significantly better. Now, um, this is the strategy that Bosch followed when they added 10 features to the Circular Saw platform to create the CS20 Circular Saw. And this turned out to be the best-selling product in North America to date. But there's other possibilities here as well, right? Um, unmet needs cannot always be addressed with an existing product platform. Uh, technology constraints uh, will often make that impossible. So here's the other option. Uh, if there are a number of unmet needs in your market that cannot be addressed on the current platform, then um, then a new platform is needed and a breakthrough or radical strategy must be pursued. Why? Because it's the only way to create more value for the customer and if you don't create that value with this new platform, then obviously somebody else will. Now, the goal of radical innovation strategy is to appeal to the market with a new platform that can address the unmet needs and enable customers to get the job done significantly better. And this is the strategy that Pandora followed. They create a new platform to get the job done better. Now, here we see a market that may not be underserved. Well, it's not underserved at all. It's appropriately served. And um, in which case, a product improvement strategy or breakthrough strategy wouldn't make any sense. If you add features to the current platform to get the job done better, um, it won't be recognized as better. There's no unmet needs. And if you create a new platform, you're just, again, wasting time and money, and uh, you're not going to get the job done any better. It's already appropriately satisfied. So in this case, a sustaining innovation strategy um, should be pursued. Uh, the opportunities, or lack of them here in this case, uh, dictate this strategy. So the goal of a sustaining innovation strategy is to carefully add just a new feature to over the years, uh, if needed, to the existing platform while really focusing on cutting product costs and uh, cost of operations at the same time. Now, uh, this is a strategy uh, that many companies follow. Uh, Coca-Cola, I use as an example here, uh, is, has done this for years. And, of course, uh, it learned its lesson of changing platforms when the market is not underserved when it introduced new Coke back in the uh, 1980s. Uh, lastly, uh, the landscape may indicate that the market is overserved could be shaped like this. This means that the market is dictating a low-cost disruptive strategy be followed. And of course, the other strategies would result in failure. And if your market looks like this and you're adding features to a new platform to get the job done better, um, it's going to add no value to the customer. So um, of course, again, what's needed here is a new low-cost platform that may not even get the job done as well. And the goal, that's the whole goal of low-cost disruptive strategy. It's to appeal to the overserved and non-consumers with a new low-cost solution that gets its job done well enough. And uh, with that new platform, um, you can often pick up new customers as well. Now, this strategy is what Google pursued when it introduced Google Docs. It's a great example of a, a low-end disruption. So um, here's the product strategy matrix that prescribes what strategy should be taken given the market conditions that exist. Again, um, you don't get a vote. And again, this is not about allocating investments based on some random percentage. Making the correct product strategy decision requires uh, good knowledge of uh, the market. 
And an idea that follows the wrong strategy is simply uh, going to fail. So um, I encourage you to use this um, insight here to help decide what strategy you should pursue, depending on the level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction with getting the job done, and the ability of the current platforms to address those unmet needs that remain in the market. So as you can see, coming up with an idea that will generate growth in any market is not easy. Uh, the chances that an idea addresses the right unmet needs in an attractive market um, and follows the right product strategy is near zero. And uh, the way to, to create ideas that generate growth is to pick a market um, successfully, understand the needs, and then the strategy first, and then generate the ideas. Well, up to this point, uh, we haven't discussed generating ideas, so I thought I'd just spend a, uh, just a very short time on that. Um, but with the market needs and strategy nailed down, we can talk about ideas. Now, to be effective at coming up with product ideas that generate growth, um, I think it's important to be aware that there are different types of ideas. Uh, they can be categorized into four different groups. Uh, ideas for product platforms, for business models, for features that go on a given platform and go to market ideas. And to be most successful for each idea, they should be um, generated in the sequence. It doesn't make sense to have ideas for uh, features if we don't even know what platform we're brainstorming about. Now the interesting thing is if you think about a traditional uh, brainstorming session, all these types of ideas are randomly generated using, uh, and usually in multiple markets as well, so there's really no focus. And then someone has to decide which of the hundreds or thousands of ideas are good. And uh, of course, they can't figure that out. It becomes an impossible exercise. But using the approach we've outlined here, you can figure out which ideas are best because you have the criteria that you need to evaluate them. Uh, those list of prioritized customer metrics or needs are the criteria. So if an idea helps a customer get a job done significantly better, and it can do so for a little cost or risk, well, then it is a good idea. It's also important to uh, think about brainstorming uh, from this perspective and breaking it out into different idea types uh, because you want domain experts available to contribute their ideas at the right time in the process. Uh, if you don't know what market and needs strategy to focus on, then you don't know what experts to invite to participate. And um, of course, you know, if, if you want platform uh, great platform experts or great platform solutions, you want to bring a platform expert in for that session. If you're looking for a business model um, solution uh, ideas, then bring a business model expert and it would make sense and so on. So the goal here, of course, is just to increase the chances of generating a winning idea. And uh, lastly, the chance of generating a great idea can be increased with the use of an effective creativity trigger. Um, I know there's lots of creativity triggers out there, and, and many of them are very general in nature, is what we've discovered. And as a result, they're not as helpful as uh, they often could be. So what we found is that by optimizing triggers around these different types of ideas, around platforms, business models, features, and um, go-to-market, that's much more effective than having a very generic set of, tri uh, of triggers. And um, I think optimizing those triggers for this purpose makes great sense. It's something we've done and uh, something that you may want to take a look at as well. We've got 26 triggers for platforms, 41 for business models, 14 for features. And this comes from you know, every source of triggers you could think of, um, uh, think of you know, scamper, trees, um, so on. You could go through the whole list. But they, um, they all uh, are in interesting in their own way. And then when they're focused on these specific types of ideas, they make a heck of a lot more sense. So uh, ideas, of course, are integral to innovation. And having the right information to generate the right ideas is the key to success. So selecting the right market, needs, and strategy, and then selecting the right tools for idea generation is certainly going to go a long way to increasing the chances of generating ideas that will accelerate your company growth. And that is the goal. So um, as you can see, uh, growth has been left to chance. And um, if you look at the answers to those last three polling questions, and you could just do a quick calculation yourself based on how you answered those questions. But um, if you answered two of those questions um, with a 25% rating and one of those with a 5%, you can quickly see your chances for success based on your own calculations. 
and you can quickly see why we say that your chances are that your idea is worth nothing. Um, the calculation uh, here shows that it's it's, a, it's almost nothing. It's 0.003% uh, just with those figures. And those, I think, align pretty closely with what we saw uh, as a result from the um, uh, polling that we've done today. Now, the chance of generating ideas that will accelerate company growth can be dramatically improved, however. And let's, again, let's just give a quick recap of how we said this would happen. So the first thing we want to do, of course, is identify an attractive market. Let's say you're trying to grow in half-billion-dollar chunks, which many large companies are. They're searching for markets that have uh, you know, $500 million or more growth potential for them. So finding them is the first step. We don't want to be creating ideas and investing money in markets that don't have that potential. Then next, we discover all the unmet needs in that market. And we want to do that with a very high confidence level. And once we know those unmet needs and we have them plotted out in that landscape that we showed you, then it becomes a lot easier to figure out if you need to pursue a disruptive strategy, a, a product improvement strategy, a radical breakthrough strategy, and so on. And then, once we have all that information, then we generate the ideas uh, that we need to address those unmet needs in that market. So when approaching innovation from this perspective, your chances of success will go up quite dramatically. And so how do we know this? Uh, well, um, I'm sorry. Let's see. Because for uh, a couple of decades now, we've had the pleasure of working with companies that apply this thinking and found that their success rates, uh, rates when using this approach are around uh, 86%. So that's about five times the industry average. And there's a nice document that you could look at uh, on our website that uh, goes into detail here. But to quantify this, uh, last year we contacted 43 companies that used this approach. We found that they put 49 products into development, 28 are still in there, or were at the time of the uh, interviews, um, and they were well, waiting large. Uh, 21 were launched, and of those, 18 were declared a success by the company. Uh, so that's an 86% success rate. So your ideas can have this level of success too, but of course starts with thinking differently about strategy and innovation and not starting innovation with an idea. So you can always learn more about our thinking by downloading the um, HBR publications, uh, white papers, and case studies on our website. And most of all, I really hope the ideas that we contributed here today um, will contribute, contribute to the success of your ideas in the future. So uh, let's now turn to the uh, audience for a few questions. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Uh, great presentation. Uh, we do have um, some questions that came in, so we'll, we'll just hop in here and, and get some of these answered. Um, in practice, when you ask people their level of satisfaction with a particular outcome, people have to make a complex evaluation of what satisfaction means to them. Do you have any tips of how you can make the task of extracting the satisfaction levels of job executors easier than simply asking, what is your current level of satisfaction with outcome X? Sure. Um, that's a great question. The reason that that's been a problem in the past is because the when, when people are asking for satisfaction levels, they're usually asking satisfaction with given solutions or given features, which requires the participant of the interviewee to, to make a lot of connections mentally in their mind. They, they're trying to figure out, um, you know, does this solution satisfy a set of needs? And that question is very complex for an individual to answer. And so we don't do that. Um, I, I've always found that you know, those kind of questions give you faulty results. So by asking the satisfaction with a metric, such as you know, how satisfied are you with your ability to minimize the time it takes to confirm receipt of a communication, we're not asking about a solution. So there is no, uh, we're not asking them to make a connection between a technology and a need. We're actually asking them about the need, which makes it quite easy for them to respond in a more effective manner. And we've done a lot of testing with this. Um, companies like Microsoft, for example, worked with us for a good year testing all different scenarios to see how accurate our, um, our, our testing methods are um, using this approach. And as it turns out, we don't need to complicate it. Um, the techniques that we use that simply ask, how satisfied are you with your ability to minimize the time it takes to confirm receipt of communication is the, the simplest, fastest, and most accurate way to get the information we need to find what the unmet needs are in the market. So um, you know, I think because a lot of us have a solution mentality, um, you know, the research can get very complicated if you're trying to figure out what solutions are best. 
and getting satisfaction levels on them. But when we're focused on the job, which is solution, solution agnostic, and these outcomes, which are simply metrics that are very precise in nature, uh, a lot of that confusion goes away, and it helps to simplify the process quite dramatically. Excellent, excellent. A um, uh, question, uh, how, or can strategies approach uh, be used to understand shopper decision-making and how to influence it? And uh, can we truly discover the needs consumers or shoppers are trying to solve for using um, using surveys? Well, sure. In terms of sh shoppers, I'd like to break that down to uh, you know when we when we study that as a uh, as an opportunity for innovation and growth. There's really two issues there. People are shopping for a product, uh, and of course, then you want to deliver them the, the best product. So you could go after a product innovation approach and make sure that you're. Uh, coming up with the products that help them get the job done best, whatever job they're you know, interested in. But then when you talk about shopping, shopping is actually a process as well. It's the job of acquiring a product. And uh, we've done studies in this where we've analyzed uh, the shopping process as a job, uh, understood all the steps that people are going through to try to uh, execute the shopping uh, process and find opportunities along the way. It is quite interesting, of course, because you know, people are looking for uh, you know, all the different alternative options. They want to run comparisons across the products. They want to you know, quickly filter those down and, to, um, and, and make the right decisions, in effect, pick the right products. So uh, studying the shopping job, I think, uh, is really quite interesting and, and very insightful. And uh, yes, it can be done using this approach. But the key here is just when you're studying it, just study it as a job. Don't confuse the product that they're buying with the process that, go, that they're going through to buy it. And I think you know, I've seen companies uh, confuse those two things. And if you separate them out and study them separately, you can come up with the best shopping process and you can come up with the best product for them to buy. Excellent. All right, another one came in from Michael here. Uh, for the case of non-user disruption, it is difficult to assess initial market size Example, the iPhone. What is the best method to correctly predict market size in this case? Uh, well, the method that we described is the best method. Uh, even if there's no product, let's say there's no product in the market, you know, pre-iPhone, pre um, and you could even assess this today. You know, is everyone using an iPhone? No, they're not because they can't afford it, right? But you can go out into the market and you can ask, how important is it that you're able to get this job done? And then find out what they're willing to pay to get that job done better or even you know, uh, to any level of satisfaction. And we typically go into about eight different uh, pricing questions, uh, willingness to pay questions to, to key in on you know, exactly what they're willing to pay to get the job done. And sometimes we find that it's less than what others are paying, which means that you have a segment of buyers that can't afford what other people are paying to get the job done which is great information to know. That suggests that you can't have a product that's going to um, you know, appeal to everyone if it's a $600 product, which is, you know, the, the example of the iPhone, I think, is very interesting because what Apple has done, in fact, is they've taken their old technology, dropped the price on it dramatically, which makes that product very interesting and appealing to people uh, who have a, a low threshold, uh, threshold for payment. You know, they couldn't pay a lot of money to get the job done because they couldn't afford it, but now they can. So they're using old technology to go after non what used to be non-consumers in the smartphone space, which of course is wreaking havoc with um, with every other uh, manufacturer of iPhones, uh, of phones I should say, of cell phones and smartphones. And you know we've had conversations with a number of uh, their competitors to help try to figure out how to offset that. And it's extremely difficult because, uh, you know, Apple's just using a, a, a great strategy to uh, to address the needs of all consumers. Excellent. And to kind of uh, piggyback off of that, can you talk about how to develop those key metrics in a new market? Uh, key metrics for, um, can you help me out with that again? Key metrics to, for To what? understand unmet needs. Um, can you, can you, uh, about how to develop the key metrics to understand unmet needs in a new market. Sure, sure, absolutely. I'll give you an example. It's one that we're working on in the in our venture space. Uh, we always found the market of uh, passing on life lessons to children quite interesting. Uh, there's not, 
there's not any great products out there for that, nothing that's electronic in nature. That, there's, there's no app for that, if you will. Uh, there's books, there's ad hoc solutions and things like that. But we can quickly go out there and talk to parents and ask them you know, what they'd be willing to pay to uh, you know, pass on life lessons to their kids. And we've done that. And the answer is great. It shows that it's a multi-billion dollar market, uh, even though there's really no uh, you know, a real product out there for it today. But we know there is, right? So how do we come up with the metrics we use to measure the success of the product? Well, we, we break down that job of passing on life lessons to children uh, into a job map. Uh, we, we, um, we ask them how they measure success along every step of the way in terms of speed and stability and output with each of those steps. And we collect those metrics that they use to measure success when getting that job done. And there's uh, roughly about 100 of them in that particular market. Now, once we have those metrics, again, we can go and find out which are important and satisfied and prioritize them and find where the opportunities exist for improving that job. Now, um, as in any brand new market where there are no products, we often see that all those outcomes, all those metrics are underserved because they just can't get any of them done because there's really no great product for it, which suggests, of course, that there's a great opportunity to you know, create a product that will help get the job done better. And in the brand new market, it doesn't have to be uh, executed, you know, a lot better. It's got to be better, but if there's no product, if you can get that um, job done 15, 20, 30 percent better, they'll actually start buying your product, and that's what we've seen. But the goal, of course, is to, you know, help them get the job done perfectly. And uh, once you've decided to enter a market, your commitment should be to head in that direction. So the first iteration, uh, the, the way we like to think about it is when we're creating uh, growth plans for companies is to envision what that platform looks like that will get the job done perfectly and then work your way towards that solution over a period of time because uh, that, that vision of what that platform and product should look like, um, that's, that's often not the 1.0 version. You know, you're going to have to, uh, you have to build your way to that. It may take three, four, five years before you actually get there. But if you know where you're going, then you can plot your um, product releases and your investments to get you there in a very systematic way. And that creates a, a roadmap that's not based on, uh, you know, learn as you go. It's based on uh, great insight up front, some great market insight that's going to, you know, get you where you want to go in the most effective way for the least cost and, um, and make you successful along each step of the way as well. Excellent, excellent. There's a lot of uh, questions coming in. Um, I, ho I wish we could answer all of them, but, but uh, with uh, regards to time, um, I don't think we're going to get to all of them, but we'll try our best. Um, so we'll, we'll try to get through these here, Tony. Um, here's one that came in from uh, Maria. How does it apply to, to services? Um, is it, it is, uh, the same, or are there other drivers uh, we must include in the research? Uh, it's exactly the same. There aren't other drivers. In fact, service is a little less complicated because it's not what we call all those consumption chain issues uh, with, you know, like in hardware, you have to set up the product, install it, interface with it, uh, maintain it, um, store it, dispose of it. Um, with a service, you don't have all those things, so, uh, so it makes it a little bit easier. But the process is exactly the same. Uh, and think of services, software, and hardware as all just different options to get a job done, right? We're, we're making the decision what the solution should be. It could be any of those things. Customers are agnostic to that. They just want to get the job done best. So we've designed this thinking around um, the job. So it, it works for services, software, hardware, all in the very same way. The, the nuances, I'd say, are, are most complicated in the product space for the reasons I stated, uh, but for software and services, it's it's much more straightforward. Excellent. Um, here's a couple questions that came in from Larry uh, that I think uh, kind of coincide with each other. Um, how do you survey non-consumers, and how do you go about identifying completely new jobs? Okay, so uh, surveying non-consumers is quite straightforward. Um, we're just looking for people who are trying to get or want to get a job done. They're often using ad hoc solutions. So we, we say they're non-consumers because they're not consuming a product, but yet they are getting the job done in their own ad hoc way. Uh, we look for those people and we ask them the same questions we would ask um, someone who's already getting the job done. So we're just so it's done the exact same way. And, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? Um, how do you go about identifying new jobs? Oh, well, that's a great question. I love that one. Um, so. Uh, 
because um, there always are new jobs, so that's a good recognition right there. Uh, uh, new jobs arise all the time. They can arise from changes in regulations. They can arise from changes in economic conditions. There's a whole number of reasons. They can uh, arise because of new discoveries. For example, once the DNA was discovered, the job of sequencing DNA um, came around and, and so on. So you, you'll see a lot of those sorts of things. So uh, we often look for changes in the environment, regulations, new inventions that give way to yet new jobs. So that's one way to look at it. And the other thing we often do is we look at current job executors and we'll simply ask them what are the jobs they'd like to get done. And the reason we do that is um, you know, once a company's established a relationship with a certain job executor, you know, they have the distribution channel set up and everything to to get them products that they need, they want to sell them more product, right? So how do you get more money from the customers that you're already serving? You do that by finding out what are the jobs that you're that they're trying to get done. And um, and if you can help them get other jobs done with the same platform you're currently using to get the you know, certain jobs done already, then that's the fastest way to increase uh, your revenue growth. Um, so that's when we stage it out that way, we would often say, you know, because companies don't come to us and say, find more jobs, that they come to us and say, we need to accelerate our, our growth. And um, the way we do that is to try to accelerate it by adding more features onto the current products to get more jobs done or to appeal to um, uh, current customers by giving them new products to get related jobs done. And then, you know, eventually you might go after a new job executed with a new job, but that's usually the last thing a company wants to do because it requires uh, investments in you know, new capabilities, new distribution, new sales channels, and that sort of thing. So we'll, we stage it out so that it's done in the in the most effective way with the least investment first. And if those opportunities don't exist, which in some cases they may not, then you are forced to invest in you know, uh, something a little more complicated if you want to continue to grow. Excellent. Um, here's a question. Uh, how does prototyping come into play when developing a new product? Well, once it goes into, uh, we typically do that. In, in, uh, when we say prototyping, I'll, I'll break it into two kinds of prototypes. One is a prototype of the product at the concept stage so that we can do concept testing to see if people are interested in, um, in that product and can envision how that might work to help them get the job done better. Uh, we'll do some prototyping in that stage for the purpose of getting them to confirm that the concept will help them get the job done better. Once that confirmation has been made, then the product can go into product development, which then goes into the next stage of prototyping, which you want to prototype to address all those uh, user uh, interface issues as well. So that's done for that purpose. Uh, just to make sure that they can set the, the device up, the uh, interface with it appropriately, store it appropriately, maintain it, uh, and all that. And so you'd prototype for that purpose as well. But that's typically done in the development phase as opposed to uh, pre-development, which I often refer to as the innovation phase of the process. Excellent, excellent. Um, here's a, a really niche question. Um, what if you make a material that is used as an ingredient in solutions? Um, that is, they help uh, do jobs better. Any comments on how we can better understand the unmet needs? Yeah, that's always that's that's usually one of the tougher um, markets to be in because you're you're basically relying on other people to create products that deliver value to customers, and you're an ingredient in them. Um, we've worked with a number of companies like that. Um, I'd say this is the most challenging. Um, oftentimes, if they want to grow, uh, they have to grow outside that market. Um, but the first thing we'd ask them to do is to see, you know, with that ingredient, can can you do something with that ingredient to help get more jobs done? Um, and you have to go to the OEM to find out what, what else are they trying to get done with that design. And they usually have other components available for that already, so you've been, you begin competing with other components. Which is possible, but um, you know, you, you in effect want to uh, you know, contribute most of to, to most of the um, uh, internal components that, that that company is using to build their product, and you want to systematically step through it to see where you might be able to go. Um, it's it's one of the tougher ways to grow, and often companies that are like that will ask them to look at um, you know other other jobs entirely. 
companies like that are more in the commodity market than anybody else, so they, they face a, quite a great challenge. A lot of the innovation is simply sustaining, and if they want to grow, they have to go beyond that. Excellent. A um, couple more before we wrap up. Um, so how would you recommend dealing with information overload? Um, how to deal with the idea avalanche where we're constantly being bombarded with uh, emails and opinions and books and news and complaints. Um, how would you, or are there any types of prioritization mechanisms to filter through these this overload? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'm overloaded with those every day, I, so I, I'm, I'm living this too. I mean, there are so many ideas. Um, so I'd like to just narrow them down to different categories of ideas. Uh, me personally, you know, I look for ideas for uh, for me to get better in my job, for example, just to be more efficient. So those are you know, personal improvement ideas, or you know, just you know, improving your ability to get your job done better. Um, but then I look for product ideas too, and um, and like I said, most ideas are worth nothing. I really believe that's true. But what I look for when I hear ideas is I actually look to see if they're in attractive markets. Uh, I did notice in the IBM jam, some of the top picks that they had weren't really product ideas. They were really more ideas to enter a market. They were a market hypothesis, as you will. They thought like a, a certain market existed where people were trying to get a job done. I look for those sorts of things to try to figure out, um, are there big growth opportunities? Uh, is, you know, are, is there a, a half billion dollar market sitting there that's untapped? And because uh, that's the true idea, uh, the true filter, I should say, of uh, of a great idea. Um, if it passes all those tests we talked about, then it is a great idea. But they're one in a million. But um, I, I do like using the ideas that I see to find markets, and um, and like I mentioned, the you know passing on life lessons to children. I like that example. We all, you know, as parents, as 147 million parents in the U.S., they live that every day, and there are no products to really help. You get that job done. So so recognizing that that's a big opportunity in a multi-billion dollar market, I find that exciting. And so I prioritize my ideas, if you will, around size of market potential and then uh, and then go from there. Excellent. Uh, a couple of last two questions that came in, both from uh, Kevin Armstrong here. Uh, where does VOC fit into your strategy? And then the second one is, is there any similarity to QFD, um, for example, analytic metrics for focus. Sure. So in terms of VOC, uh, VOC um, was started by engineers that were frustrated with marketing's inability to give them a complete set of customer needs. and um, But they would give them a product concept. So um, VOC is really all about making a better product and getting uh, getting needs related to all those consumption chain jobs I talked about, um, you know, product interface, setup, installation, usage, and so on. And um, I, I think it's fairly easy to get those kind of inputs from customers using any kind of language once you show them the product because you're trying to work with them to think through how the interface should work and things like that. So if there is a role for DLC, I would say, uh, that's where it is, where it originally started, you know, back in the product development phase when you're trying to actually design the product. Uh, I do think there are better tools. Uh, using this approach that we described here, you could envision um, you know, understanding the job of installing a product or understanding the job of interfacing with a product, storing a product, and you can get a generic uh, universal set of metrics for each of those jobs as well and use those to drive your design uh, in your organization. And we've done that with a few companies. And then uh, just in terms of uh, the QFD, um, you know, I, I, liked, I, I loved QFD back in the 80s. It was you know, one of the first tools that really tried to bring a set of metrics to, um, to the design and the innovation side of things. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that there's, I mean, it's certainly in the back of my head that that exists. I like that. I like the approach. Um, and I, I've had other QFD uh, experts tell me that this is like the you know, the fifth generation of QFD, where we've netted it down to a set of metrics on a job that people are trying to get done, and to that degree, there you know there are metrics, so we have that commonality, which I I, I, I do like. I think having metrics assigned to uh, growth is great because now you can measure uh, 
how much value you're creating for a customer, and then you can connect that to how much they're willing to pay to get that job done better. You can connect it to growth. So uh, QFD didn't do any of those sorts of things. QFD, I still I view that as more of a, a design level tool as well, where there's just levels and levels of metrics that uh, the organization uses to make sure all the um, design is, is integrated in an appropriate manner. So um, I still room for QFD, of course, in the uh, design phase, which is, uh, I believe is still being used quite extensively. Excellent. All right. And with that, uh, I think I speak for everyone, Tony. Uh, great presentation, um, and thanks for, for sticking on to uh, answer some of the questions. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we're all out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank Tony Olwig from Stratagen and all of you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the webcast presentation, and we will be sending you a link to the archived version shortly. If you have any further questions or need any further information, um, like Tony mentioned, please visit the Stratagen website at www.stratagen.com. Again, thank you all for your time. Have a great day.